So, um, thank you very much uh, for coming along and um, really have a, my greatest pleasure to have a free, very brilliant um, poets, uh, women poets, um, joining us today um, to talk about or to share poems um, to do with her motherhood or and beyond motherhood. So um, I would like to, um, you know, thank uh, Liz Berry, Lucy Mercer and Sarah Le Estridge for, um, you know, joining us today. And um, so um, I think um, without further ado, I'm going to um, in introduce some of, um, you know, the, our first reader. Um, and um, later on, we'll keep the questions for later. And um, so Lucy, um, Mercer, she is a, a writer um, who has just, um, you know, got a hot off the press, uh, got a new collection coming out. So Lucy Mercer, she's based in London and her poems have been published widely in magazines and anthologies. And she was awarded the inaugural White Review Poets Prize. Emblem, published by Prototype this year, um, is her debut collection, which revitalizes this forgotten hybrid form in the present as a frame to contemplate the obscurities of motherhood and faith and the interior. These poems um, capture the alternating relationships between text and image, blurring them into the relations between mind and body, child and mother, red and green, past and present, for the public and private self, as well as um, the living and the dead. So, um, this has us very intrigued, and I just really can't wait to hear Lucy's. Um, thank you very much. It's welcome. Thanks, Jenny. And it's really lovely to do this reading. Um, yeah, the, the book is um, focused on these early modern emblems, which were like woodcut pictures that had a motto and a poem. So they were kind of three different parts mixing together. Um, and when I started studying this book, the book's in Latin and I can't read Latin. So I was studying a book I couldn't read and I just had a baby and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I think in my head, these things have now merged because I think trying to understand a little baby is a bit like trying to read a language you can't understand. Um, so the book is a kind of strange admixture of these two things, really, I guess, misusing the idea of an emblem in a new context. Um, some of the poems in the book are more mother, mother centered than others, I think. Um, I'm going to read one called Westworld, um, which first started off as a poem about Where's Wally? But that's another kind of picture book, but not an early modern picture book. Westworld. When I hear stories of what happens to bodies, I cover the holes in my face, as my son, too, has a body. As if I could board up the unhinged doors and windows of this unfortunate saloon, leaving extreme worry out in the midday sun, crushing violets and sticking them onto cactuses, shooting deer that look like other cowboys, who, after all, learn from their mothers a reckless love of the pursuit of death. If I believed, I could ring up my heart's transparent attorney and ask, please, don't let him be horribly damaged. There aren't any phone lines out here. There don't seem to be any women either. In the sunlit display of the thoroughway, a grocer kneels in the dirt to crack a coconut. After watching its liquid flying about, he replaces it with the others in the stack, the top back on, not perfect, but back on, like a television showing fire in a fireplace. Perhaps our desire to order what breaks is our best human feeling. Like Piccinelli, who wanted to make a book of the world, he found a bundle that grew into a heap, 
then a huge shapeless mass and felt compelled to dispose this chaos into some ordered design. It grows dark. Trees and streets are a grey glue from the window. My son's favourite book is where you look for a man who hides in the middle of large crowds. We look at it again, our faces pressed close. At first it seems he's not in the picture and so is unlikely to be found. But he is there and in this book, each question has an answer. Where is the man in a fountain? Where is the keen barber? The puncture caused by an arrow? A waiter who isn't concentrating? A dog on a roof? A boy attacked by a plant? Where is a man coming out of a manhole? Where are two firemen waving at each other? My son is sleeping like a peach stone. Tonight, after walking a world, the picture man opens his mouth for me and I can see his throat looks the same as mine. He says, satisfactory questions. He says, where the answer has already been decided. Why are you looking out here? Criminal defendants. He says, history, not this history. Your face, my face. No answers. A book, but not a world. He says, a world, but no book like mine cannot imitate your face. What you know now, what does knowing do, has ever done? Who are you looking for? Um, so some of these poems I wrote really quite early on in early motherhood and that time where you know night is day and day is night that sort of gray time um and i think that kind of is in the book a lot that that gray kind of obscurity uh this poem's called single mothers study metaphysics in labor on all fours changing what is elsewhere for what is here the body casts vomit onto the floor. The mind images it is drowning. I high muddy ocean, two boys floating on the rising rose, forever watching the cinematic threshing floor of its own inquisition, this mind that is the body's idea, which demands a repayment, the damage done by its investment, guttering sense with sensation, like a candle tired of speaking. How often now it practices disruptment, pacing and smoking around the foxglove's purple in pieces, sometimes folded into its knees, for it, the mirror, its only witness. And this one's called Single Mother. They are the only two poems in the book that have single mother in the title, but there you go. Single Mother. The sea dropped its findings or unfastened as two brief lit hard parapets unfastened, made a wild chronotape out of my body. But now, said Anne, I am matronly. My climax is perverse in their free zigzags of melted sutures. These stiff fingers, aliens of no beginning, alone with me, Another evening in, spent moving them across my picture books, watching clouds dream, spray and spray across the silver sealed sea. Fell into the matricine, our problematic 10,000 years of thorny overwhelmed mothers flighted spinning in such spheres of fright. Mothers repeating poly, poly, polyglot. Mother's seeming ears with moly the plant. Mother's levering scabs on legs, earliest of the sofa. Mother's plucking hairs like shot birds preparing themselves. No eschatologies. Um.
There's a poem in here called Two Lullabies, which I'd like to read, not for any other reason that I remember talking to Liz a long time ago about lullabies and she had such interesting things to say about them and has written such interesting poems, which are lullabies. To lullabies. I know now my life understood as a barless music of pressures, that reflection is composition. My twin daughters, when they were born, felt light as brains in both arms. And now, memorandum spilling onto the floor. It's mother geese coming down the stairs. Cards made for a game I have forgotten why or for whom I am playing. The rain shakes the sky with its falling lines, like our endless requests, mammal. What parsley in a washed jam jar is foolish enough to lean out like a crowd, waving their parsley green handkerchiefs to an invisible spectacle passing by? This spectacle, surprisingly, is not a celebration. Say, take these hands. Take these hands, the hands of a mother. Take my strength away from me. Take me on credit. Take me with you. Like greenness, sense only comes after. These hands are given over. And the last poem I'm going to read is quite a short one. I was interested when I was writing this also in the idea of objects being riddles and maybe the idea of being a mother being something like a riddle and maybe when objects like apples or mirrors speak in riddles they're also reflecting that maternal riddle back to us. This poem's called Mirror. Mirror. I go deep into my instincts, but domestication pulls me back. Like the way the wind takes a line, takes these wet t-shirts against itself. Not that I feel it, the wind. I just see it like everything else. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Liz. Um, this is wonderful. It's just... Um, really very immediate language and such, um, you know, like bringing back lots of memories and um, questions about how the body, you know, like the sort of alienation of the body itself and also with the, the, um, the children. And um, as you say, those um, early days of motherhood are just such a curious and um, strange, yeah, just curious. We capture it so well. From this time. So, um, Thanks very much, and um, we'll save the questions for later. Um, sorry. Sorry, because um, this is... <laughs> There is a little bit of change in my computer's um, layout. So um, I would like to um, welcome our next reader, um, Sarah Le. Um, Sarah Le is a um, writer and po a poet from London. And um, her debut pamphlet, um, Say, which was recently published with Flip Die, um, her poetry um, is, um, is a really beautiful um, you know, um, chapbook. Um, and her poetry, she wrote, writes poetry, creative nonfiction and reviews, and they have appeared in a variety of places, including The Guardian, The New Statesman, Poetry Review, Wasafiri and others. Um, Sarah Le has also received commission from the BBC, National Trust, the Bronte Society and the Ledbury Poetry Festival. Um, she was um, a, a one of the Ledbury critics and um, she's also an educator um, at, at a poetry school, we're running um, workshops for um, at Alzac Poetry School and has taught um, in a variety of settings, including students on the Colonial Countryside Projects in collaboration with the University of Leicester 
um, National Trust and People Tree Press. And um, and um, here, well, we we'll welcome um, Sarah to read for us. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to read um, alongside Liz and Lucy today. Really excited to be here and really loved hearing your poems, Lucy. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the discussion um, after Liz has read, which I'm also really looking forward to. Um, I, I'm not widely known for my poetry about motherhood. I'm more, I'm known more for writing about identity, um, particularly mixed race identity, also grief, um, personal, intergenerational and um, national. Um, and so let me just get my, yeah, but those people who've known me for um, sort of at least a decade will know that actually nine years ago when I first got the poetry bug and started to really write poetry seriously, I couldn't write about anything other than motherhood. Um, so um, some of these poems that I'm going to be reading for you this evening um, are older and some of them are newer. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start with a poem called Chrysalis. Uh, it's about the transformational experience of pregnancy, particularly late pregnancy, um, during that exciting and terrifying time when a woman is making that transition into motherhood. Chrysalis. Mothers, now I see them in mud-splashed parks and yellow cafes, pushing pushchairs, feeding open mouths in high chairs, chasing their offspring, offsprung. The world is interesting, tall, small, brunette, blonde, colonizing paths and green spaces like crocuses in the springtime. These last weeks I have eaten to fullness, stuffing this tight striped drum with apples like moons. Now a green shell is blooming around me. I can no longer see, but I can hear them calling, calling, and there is no one here to stop my ears. My knees, my elbows, there is little time left. I can feel the wings curled at my back. So I should admit that I had, I had some trouble sort of choosing the poems to read for this evening. I think in light of what's going on in the world and, and in the States in particular and so I just wanted to say, actually, I want to say it before I started that obviously um, these poems are about chosen motherhood and that um, motherhood should always be a choice. Uh, the other thing, yeah, okay. So one of the first poems I read about motherhood that really wowed me um, was The Language of the Brag by Sharon Olds. And she takes the subject of, mother, of childbirth and somehow manages to capture in words what a momentous and heroic act childbirth is. And my next poem attempts to do something similar, but my intentions in writing this poem were also to um, destigmatize childbirth, to let it be something we write about and talk about more, um, to acknowledge that lots of women fear it and that it's painful, but that it's also something that women have been doing for all time, you know, <laughs> across all countries, cultures, religions the whole world. So it started. It started. It started with a pulling at the small of my back that tugged and tugged till the spaces between crashed into themselves and flamed and flamed. Hospital, cool, the hospital. You dialed, but on the other side, 
the word was no, wait it out. It was getting dark fast as you sat on the chair and I curled over the linen like it had me tied and a scream gripped the iron bars of the room and shook and shook and shook. The windows of me were gaping, fanning the flames that seared through epidermis, dermis, subcutis, the rest. I wanted to take it off my flesh, wanted to forget and wake again at dawn start again when I was better prepared, when it would be enough to know that Eve had been here and Maya Devi and Sita and Khadija and Matatripta, and it was okay, I would be okay. The baby would be okay, we all would. Okay, the next poem I'm going to read is quite different. It's called um, The Edible Girl. And it's about the pressures society puts on girls and women to you know, give of themselves. Um, and as Audre Lorde said, often um, as women and girls, if we um, didn't define ourselves for ourselves, we could easily be eaten alive, which is the quote that opens my poem. The Edible Girl. One. I woke to find I was an edible girl with heart of Deglinor and brain of bitter gourd limbs of barley and ribs of corn, teeth carved from coconut flesh, neck whittled from sugar cane, feet of water, stomach of hollowed cassava melon, sex of samol, breasts of beet, lips of stripped apple skin, hair of sarg, boiled and stirred into string. Hands of Moriolo olives, nails of almond, skin of squeezed marigold, and eyes stolen from the beating chest of plumstones. Two. I gave my heart to my mother, for she was hungry and unrequited. I gave my brain to my father, for he was inspired and disillusioned. I gave my limbs to my stepfather, for he was preoccupied with freedom. I gave my ribs to my sister to remind her to stand tall. I gave my teeth to my grandmother to create illusions of closeness and distance. I gave my neck to my grandfather to conjure the impression of height. I gave my feet to my uncle to ease his travel. I gave my stomach to my teachers and let them fill at will. I gave my sex to my husband and breasts to my children, gave them permission to chew and chew till the red juice spilled. I gave my lips to co-workers and my hair to past lovers, hands to all those I ever called employers. I gave up my nails to the government because they called them claws. I gave my skin to my friends and my eyes to all the artists who were so kind as to spit them back out but only once they had been crushed to dust. Um, okay, so the, 
I feel like a lot of the representations of mothers in literature and in media tend to represent motherhood as two extremes, either as perfect, saintly, or as, you know, horrific, monstrous and unknowable. Um, my experience of motherhood and all, all the really good, write, you know, the good writing about motherhood acknowledges that, you know, motherhood is much more complex than that. And so when I'm writing about motherhood, I'm, I'm writing against those myths. Um, and I'm also, um, yeah, sort of trying to show the complexity. So this next poem is called Woman, Saint, Mother. Woman, Saint, Mother. I was never less ready for motherhood than this moment. Standing in front of my six-year-old son, and he suddenly so inquisitive, asking who God is and why people die. I can only answer honestly, I don't know. And I see the disappointment on his face, bright as colostrum. The bad mother, more Magdalene than saint, I haven't mastered the art of meditation or eternal optimism. Samadhi having pers persistently eluded me, my mind as a rover, wondering where it shouldn't, over mountains or into dark cramped caves, I struggle sometimes to pull myself out of. I say none of this to him, though he notes the, snow the slowness of response frequent dampness of cheek. Child, please don't see these as signs of lack of love. If love could be measured in exhales, I would be breathless. I promise I want nothing more than to rejoice in every cell of your being, extraordinary, mediocre and imperfect cells. But rogue teacher that I am, I have still so much to learn. Okay, and my final poem is called The Gorge. And um, it's a poem that I, I read recently, actually this Tuesday at the Sabatero Awards because it also falls within, uh, loosely within the remit of eco-poetry as well. Um, I was speaking earlier this week saying how much I am excited by the porosity of boundaries and how a poem can be many things. Uh, it can be about motherhood, it can be about eco-poetry, a poem can encompass all sides of, our, of us. Um, so this is my final poem. It's, um, it's called The Gorge. Um, just before I get started, I would just say that it, just to set the scene a bit, it it's, was written during sort of, I'd say probably about a year, in that first year of my second child, um, during that first year, when um, just any time alone is really precious, um, is sort of Hard, hard to come by and this poem was written in a moment where I was um, in the forest on my own and how uh, motherhood sort of being on your own for the first time and it's feeling quite vulnerable so this is a poem that explores that a bit. The Gorge. Red ochre squelching underfoot holding on to her souls, then relenting, letting go. She walks into the deep green, not knowing which way, but not wanting to turn back. The canvas of green and red, blurring her edges, making her reckless. Except the granite sky, the wind whipping hard, her shoes ravaged by mud. 
she finds herself in a gorge, ripe, overflowing, the water tumbling from wet hand to wet hand, creating a dozen fresh water parts. Her foot sticks, another step and her foot sinks half a meter into the soil. A rustling in the leaves from the trees on her right and the fear never far away returns of being found. By whom? She doesn't know, but the cold knife slicing through her abdomen is real. Terror cuts to her lungs. The red ochre in her veins runs to her heart and flees again, disperses into valves, capillaries. She breathes in red and green as her feet pummel the soil, travel the water paths carved in the earth's skin. This, would, what, this was what she had wanted, to be alone. But not this, the crack and recoil of thunder as gunshot, her heart punishing her chest. She wishes she had done something useful with her youth, like learn a martial art. Her youth now almost gone, 34, not young, not old, somewhere in between. She turns back to the trees. Here is a path she recognizes, this ditch, this hassock. It's not the path she'd planned on taking, but she takes it now, appearing at the front door, mud up to her shins, flushed, smiling. I took the long way back. And I think I will stop there. I realize um, I'm not sure, I haven't actually read anything from my pamphlet <laughs> um, because that's more about the themes that I've said earlier, but many of those poems that I've just read will be in my forthcoming collection, um, which is coming out with Nine Arches Press in January, 2023. So thank you very much for listening. Oh, thank you very much, um, Sarla. Just wonderful, like many moving poems for us. Um, that's, and also, um, I, as you mentioned, um, motherhood, um, it's a lot of things and it's also beyond motherhood in a way and um, all these other things that um, dimensions of the self, um, it's very worth interrogating. And I think also um, these new poems just reveal so much um, of someone that I know you personally, and I feel like it's just kind of um, opened up a very, like lots of new things to think about, about how when you perceive someone, you know, how much do you know, or what's on their mind. And um, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so Thanks, I would, um, um, yeah, really um, let you, uh, let all of us um, kind of, um, you know, think about these um, questions um, that the poets have given us. Um, and at the same time, I'm ha very happy to also, um, you know, introduce our uh, third uh, reader uh, today, um, is uh, Liz Berry. As many of us know her poetry, um, you know, um, it's just um, really stunning. And um, she, um, born in the Black Country and now living in Birmingham, um, um, Liz Berry's um, first collection of poems, um, Black Country, um, was about the, uh, her native West Midlands. Um, and um, she received a Somerset Morecambe Award, the Geoffrey Faber Award and Ford Prize for Best First Collection. Um, and her, um, uh, her book, The Republic of Motherhood by Chattel, was a poetry book society pamphlet choice. And, um, you know, um, it's just such a powerful statement um, on um, being mother, um, and um, uh, it won the Forward Prize for Best Single Poem. Her latest collection, The Dereliction, um, Hercules Editions, is a collaboration with artist Tom Hicks. Um, this is a patron at Writing West Midlands and works as a tutor for Avon and the Poetry School. Um, just welcome, Liz. Oh, thanks, Jenny. And thank you for those two beautiful readings. What a treat to kind of spend time in the company of these brilliant 
mom poets so thank you both for those beautiful readings i'm just going to follow on from that lovely chat that was happening at the end of the reading then about thinking of motherhood not just in the sense of the children that we care for but the people that we care for it's something i've thought about such a lot recently the different ways maternal energy might manifest and sort of make its way into the world um, so i'll start with a newer poem about that it's a poem called tend and um i realized that during the the lockdowns i was sort of caring for my house plants <laughs> In this really loving, tender way, almost in the way actually I wished I could just care for all the people I loved, um, sort of nurturing and slightly controlling of them. <laughs> so here it is, tend. I want to lift everyone I love into the sunlight of my windowsill and tend to them like houseplants, bathe their bodies with warmth. It's like their thirst with a delicate atomizer. And if humidity is what they crave, carry them into the steamy bathroom and let the vapors heal them. Mom, Kathleen, Richard and his cats, my drunk sad neighbor with the cuts on his knuckles. Let them leave behind their sorrow and live as plants do, thinking only of nourishment the lush suck of water shamelessly turning their faces to the sun let them close their eyes in contentment knowing i am watching over them little mother listening to their leaves for a sign how beautiful they could be my eldest son climbing green as an ivy kieran on day release his scars of pink and emerald phytonia. And in the centre, my father, sweet, failing, maidenhair fern, his rackety lungs and sliding words, how his fronds might fan to feathers in my tending, green rising from the dark dead to curl as his hair did in the wet June wood. Going to read some poems about sort of being a mom and about mothers, and something that sort of is endlessly fascinating and preoccupying to me, which is the sort of complex, curious sensuality around motherhood and mothers. So I'll start with a poem called The Visitation. And the visitation is the sort of beautiful moment in the Bible when Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist, goes to visit Mary, who's pregnant with Jesus. Sort of this really intensely beautiful, sensual moment. And as I was writing this poem and I was pregnant, I thought to myself, what might this look like if it happened on a playing field in Dudley? <laughs> so here it is. The visitation. Eloise. I opened too soon, a foxglove on that papered bed, my water's sweet and grassy as the cut side at dawn, and cried when the little nurse drew the curtains around me, saying, push went you a long night ahead, and left me to watch the sun tumble and climb through high gridded windows. In the cubicles around me, women were sobbing, I lay my cheek against the cold bars of the trolley as my body clenched and unfurled. And I slept for just a moment. And in that moment, I was 14 again. Still your girl. Lying on my back on the playing fields in Dudley. Blue school skirt hitched. The unmown grass wet against my thighs. Summer over spilling. Everything loosened. You knelt before me. Your scent of hairspray and menthol kylo in my lungs took my face in your palms, placed a crown of daisies in my hair and held me down until I bloomed, my mouth spilling flowers, feverish, through the folds and gardens, donkey bites and alleys, the doll's house terraces where girls dreamt. I knew the time had come to yield like a meadow, 
So I did love, and you moved through me like the May breeze, and I was blessed. This next poem is a, another poem that sort of speaks to that strain, sort of sensuality of, of motherhood and, and the maternal body. It's a poem called Highbury Park, and everyone always thinks of this poem as a sort of a poem about, about sex or, or um you know cruising but in fact for me it sort of came from the opposite after I had my first son I think my body felt so profoundly shocked and damaged for such a long time I sort of felt quite lost to that world of sensuality or the erotic but found it appearing in curious ways like with the wind <laughs> and you'll hear in this poem there's a line like after he's born I wanted nothing but the wind to hold me and that just felt so sort of um intense and profoundly true. Highbury Park. In the woods at night, men are fucking amongst the gorgeous pinatas of the rhododendrons, the avenue of cool lines. By day I walk my son down the secret pathways, smell the salt rhyme of sex on the wind, a condom glowing with blossomy cum, knotted, and flung. I bury it gently under the moss with my boots. I envy them, these lovers. Dark pines beneath their knees, the tarry earth alpaline with the desire paths of snails, fallen feathers in the dirt like warnings. I know those days of aching to be touched by no one who knows you. After he was born, I wanted nothing but the wind to hold me. The soft mouth breeze coaxing my skin like the grass from a trampled field. How heavenly it seemed then. Light shafting emerald through wounded leaves. The woods a church, we its worshippers. And all that sex freed from love and duty like being taken by the wind swept from the cloistered rooms of your life, stripped and blown, then jilted, dazzling in the arms of the trees. This um, next poem I'll read is a longer poem. It's the title poem of the pamphlet, The Republic, the Republic of Motherhood. Um, this was a really hard poem to write. And in many ways, even, you know, my sons are older now. It's still quite a hard poem to read. Um, but it's a really important poem to me. The Republic of Motherhood. Across the border into the Republic of Motherhood and found it a queendom, a wild queendom. I handed over my clothes and took its uniform its dressing gown and undergarments, a cardigan soft as a creature smelling of birth and milk. And I lay down in motherhood's bed, the bed I had made but could not sleep in, for I was called at once to work in the factory of motherhood, the owl shift, the graveyard shift, feeding, cleaning, loving, feeding. I walked home, heart sore, through pale streets, the coins of motherhood singing in my pockets. Then I soaked my spindle bones in the chill municipal baths of motherhood, watching strands of my hair float from my fingers. Each day I pushed my pram through fleas, freeze and blossom down the wide boulevards of motherhood where poplars bent their branches to stroke my brow. I stood with my sisters in the queues of motherhood, the weighing clinic, the supermarket, waiting for its bureaucracies to open their doors as required. I stood beneath the flag of motherhood and opened my mouth although I did not know the anthem. When darkness fell, I pushed my pram home again. By lamplight, wrote urgent letters of complaint to the Department of Motherhood but received no response. I grew sick and was healed in the hospitals of motherhood, with their long-closed isolation ward, 
a narrow bed watched over by a fat moon. The doctors were slender and efficient. And when I was well, they gave me my pram again so I could stare at the daffodils in the parks of motherhood while winds pierced my breasts like silver arrows. In snowfall, I haunted motherhood cemeteries, the sweet fallen beneath my feet. Our lady of the birth trauma, our lady of psychosis, I wanted to speak to them, tell them I understood, but the words came out scrambled. So I knelt instead and prayed in the chapel of motherhood, prayed for that whole wild fucking queendom, its sorrow, its unbearable skinless beauty. And all the souls that were in it, I prayed and prayed until my voice was a night cry. Sunlight pixelating my face like a kaleidoscope. And I'll just read two more poems. Again, they kind of come from that weird place of, of moms and bodies and sensuality. This is a new poem, it's called Godspeed. Godspeed. When we fork in sweet darkness, I leave my body behind. Rising from her as smoke rises from the forging fire. Godspeed, I tell her, as we part like lovers on the threshold. I want to begin again. Move as the creatures of the air do. Birds, moths. Ghosts shimmering in the empty streets, the theremin song of the trees as they shed their inhibitions against the gold light. The blood and dueling of the body, its grief and burden abandoned like an unreadable book. I wish I could take you with me, but one of us must stay behind. Keep watch upon the darkness. Our sun's warm limbs reaching like tendrils from their cots. And finish with this poem. It's a, a little sweet poem, really. Um, it's called Horse Heart and it comes from sort of the many, many days and nights spent on antenatal wards throughout my pregnancies. When all you can ever hear is that gorgeous, curious sound of, of, of baby's heart sort of thundering. And they're so fast, they don't even sound like hearts at all. They sound like horses' hooves or galloping at once. Um, so this is sort of a, a little love poem about that time. Horse heart. It's a stable in here. The sodden hay of broken waters, each of us private and lowing in our stalls, while all night from the monitors, the sound of babies' hearts like hooves, stumbling, stamping through our bodies into the high, wet grass of their lives. How reckless they are, lost now, then again in snowy fields of static, too fast and they're gone too slow, and they might never reach us at all, but fall, heads crowned by vetch and dandelion, noses cold to the belly of earth. These horse nights, darkless nights, the endless running of the herd, fear a hoof upon my chest, my lion must sweat and beckon you up, little horse heart. Bowl. Let my love be your paddle, your bridle, your trough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just um, yeah, um, 
it, it's um, very just startlingly beautiful, like, and especially, the, um, you know, the Republic of Motherhood, like, um, is, has given me so much strength, and, um, you know, and I, listening to it again, it's very, a uh, very emotional experience. So um, I think, um, let's um, give a great thanks uh, to our readers um, for just, like, such wonderful um you know, like, um, and such um, a range of emotions and, um, you know, like dimensions of being um, mothers and also much more about mothers as well, um, which I find really fascinating, like how, how much you capture about the body and the mind. And um, so I think we, we can, um, you know, let's have all of you, um, you know, like we can have a conversation together and um, really welcome also um, questions from um, the audience, um, you know, like what, what are your responses to these works that um, are new and, um, you know, like published works. Um, and um, I also have some questions, but I would like to see, let me just make sure that, yeah. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat box. Um, and it's just amazing to, um, listen to it. Um, I mean, maybe first off, I just wanted to kick off to um, understand a little bit further about, you know, the connections between all your words about, um, for example, stereotypes, because I think motherhood is so much subject to stereotypes. And, um, you know, even though that there's such a already such a wide range of poems um, written um, before and now, um, what do you think about, you know, like, what's your purpose? I know, especially also, if you listen to maybe Sarah, Lewis, she said, like, she, she wouldn't normally write about motherhood as well. And I, I just find it all fascinating, like, how do you approach this idea? If like, do you, in your works, how do you break down those stereotypes? Or do you, do you even feel conscious about it? Or are you just like, how do you tackle that dimension of your identity? Um, any, please feel free, anyone. <laughs> you want me to go Sorry. first, Sorry. fellow yeah. moms? Um, that's such an interesting question, Jenny, with this idea of stereotypes. Because actually, I think the stereotypes about, about motherhood are kind of linked to the stereotypes of writing about motherhood uh, and gave me an incredible amount of shame and anxiety about writing these poems, writing the Republic of Motherhood. This idea that motherhoods um, and, and moms are really sweet and kind of neutered and, and gentle and sentimental. In fact, the first time I ever was about to read from the Republic of Motherhood, the interviewer is interviewing as a man. He went, so how have you avoided the inevitable pitfall of sentimentality? <laughs> Which kind of taught me an awful lot about the way people um, approach it. So I think for me, it was about being very kind of raw and curious about it and also lifting it and elevating it and, and trying to break down some of that shame around it and that trivialising of, um, of women's writing, women's work, women's endeavours. Yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Lucy, I've seen you ban me. Okay. Um, I guess, yeah, I kind of think the same with the, the fear of sentimentality. I suppose with motherhood, when I wrote the poems for Emblem, I didn't, and I don't know whether this says something actually about fear of motherhood writing, which I never understood why that's distinguished from general life and why it needs a special category. but. Um, you know, I didn't want to write about going to the park and stuff because I felt that actually I needed to come at, come at it adjacently. And I felt that maybe in terms of thinking about stereotypes, the kind of symbolic arena of motherhood is not explored enough and that what we're given as symbols of motherhood is not enough it's not like good enough so I suppose I would be 
I was focusing on that more than anything else. Mm. Yeah, so. yeah, I just, um, yeah, so much of what has already been said. I'm trying to think what I can also add to that. Um, it's, I think, yeah, what Liz was saying about the writing about motherhood is sort of in linked up with also just motherhood. So taboos, things that you're not supposed to talk about. Um, also, also, I think another thing that's quite tricky is, um, yeah, ad ad admitting, you know, the difficulties of motherhood and then sharing that with others and then sharing that with, with you know, family, family members. And, um, you know, also, I think something that's also been quite interesting for me is as my children are going old, getting older, thinking about them also reading these poems. Um, which has added another layer of, I don't, I, I don't want to say censorship, but certainly thought, you know, more thought has gone into the writing of these poems, realising that, oh, this, the subject of these poems, you know, are growing up now, they, you know, when they're small, they're, you know, you don't imagine reading the poem, but, but as you get older, you, you become aware that, oh, they may well read those poems. So, yeah, it's, it's all the things that we don't talk about. Um, in society those are the things that interest me um you know that's why we write um is to discuss to bring things to the table that uh, we don't talk about in day-to-day -day lives or to approach it from you know from new angles so uh yeah so that just makes you know all writing is really difficult but i think it makes writing about motherhood that much more mm. challenging um Yes, I think um, these are all very, um, you know, provocative, um, you know, thought provoking. Um, I think, um, how about, you know, like in terms of um, some of us are, you know, like other than mothers, we were once daughters, or we're, we're or, um, our own reflecting on our own mothers. Um, I don't know if anyone kind of, uh, find that also a difficult subject to deal with. Um, Someone has just put in the chat oh, this, right. this moment. Um, let's see, uh, Madeline. I've been considering how I might write about learning how mm -hmm. to mother as a woman who hasn't been mothered in a safe and nurturing way. Mm. Um, so that I just thought, as you were asking that question, there, there was that mm. in the chat. Um, yeah. Sorry, sorry, what was the, the question? Yeah, uh, no, what do you think about maybe Madeline's um, idea about that, like um, not being mothered in a safe and nurturing way? Any reflection on that? Or, yeah, which is actually kind of similar to what I was thinking about as well. Yeah, well, I think so. I think your question was how does um, being, uh, being also the being child, a daughter, and, yeah, being yeah. a daughter also yeah. impact on your writing? And I think. We, we were talking about this sort of before the, we, we started on. And, and I think um, we were saying that writing about motherhood can be an act of reclamation and mm. also motherhood itself. You know, if, if you haven't been mothered the way that you want to be mothered, that it, it's new, you know, when you're doing it for the first time, it, it's new for you. Um, yeah, I want to hear what the other poets have to say. I was going to say, Lucy, would, would you talk a bit about this? Because this is something that's kind of come up in our chats, hasn't it? As, mm. as writing about your more, more complex relationships that might answer Madeline's question. Yeah, I think if you've got a difficult maternal relationship, that can, I don't know, for me, like, um, I, when, I, when I'm writing, actually, because a single mother poems came up in the chat, I guess to me, when I became a single mum, I also kind of felt like a single mum in a kind of maternal lineage, um, like I was doing it. And I think there's an element probably to every mum where you are kind of doing it for the first time, mm -hmm. how, you're, how you'd like to do it. Or, you know, there's something weird where ma maternity is like multiple and generational, and it's also quite singular and to me single mother doesn't just mean 
being a single parent, but also maybe remaking the idea of what it means to be a mother. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but I do think that there's something about when, when you have children, you know, your kind of old self dies in a way. And mm. I think every mother kind of refashions themselves in a way that maybe will never be a kind of holistic sense that it was before, but a kind of multiple of things, a multiple thing and a single thing. Mm. I just wanted to also add, like Karen, Karen puts in puts in the chat. You can learn what you don't want to do as well as what you want mm. to do. Being a mother, that's such a powerful statement as well. Um, it's true, Lucy. I think I can see that happening, like in your poems, the wisdom that you know that all these. Um, sort of um, the complexity, basically, the, 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 the sort of new way of seeing um, that experience. Um, and also claiming, reclaiming, um, as Madeline says, actually, um, love, she loves that idea of reclamation, becoming a new self as a mother. By the way, if anyone wants to, to, <laughs> to, to jump in and you know, share a bit of your thoughts, please feel free. You can try to unmute yourself and share a thought or two um i got a question as well here like charlotte charlotte says um lucy um asked lucy about the woodblock prints that inspire your poems um do you want to say something about that <laughs> yeah um and they were first printed 400 years ago and i felt they were the kind of thing where they've kind of come into your time from another time they're quite distinctly from another time and I think having a baby is also a bit like having a thing from another time come into your time like crash into it you know like a planet and your you know your time is altered by that time um, and yeah. also with the images uh, they've got these borders they're quite strange borders mm -hmm. and I felt like they were kind of falling into these ornate frames that felt like something to fall into to um the, on the cover there's it's it's supposed to be a dolphin but it doesn't really look like one it's like an idea of what a dolphin might look like it's more snaky um and turning and i quite like these displacements where we're going into the imaginary it's also that's a dolphin that's washed you know Fallen, fallen out of the sea um, onto a beach. I think maybe that's a bit like becoming a mother as well. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, kind of mythologizing um, or you know, remaking that mother image. And um, how, um, sorry, just another question, Jita, about motherhood being a generative, can, a, can motherhood be a generative and creative state? Country to received wisdom. That's, that's a... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully. Yes. <Yeah. laughs> I think so. But to, but but I also think we need to be maybe a bit kinder to to mums, to mothers, mm. to mother writers. Maybe just a bit kinder to to people in general because I think it can be a really creative state but there's lots of things that need to be around that creative state for it to happen so that's mm -hmm. everything and we might talk about this and unpack it a bit more but it's everything from kind of childcare that enables you to write to sort of these brilliant grassroots organizations you know I was thinking about things like maternal journal or the mum poem press that sort of gather mums in and lift them and encourage them to write and connect with each other um, and also taking the, the pressure off with the writers the idea that you know somehow you'll just carry on writing as if nothing has changed in your life mm. just you'll be just doing your best work seamlessly whereas actually we, there's a lot that needs to happen to support that and make space for it um, so kind of yeah we need to look after our 
mom writers in order to make and kind of enable that really creative creative space that creative time but i'll be really interested to hear what the other two poets think i just want to say yeah uh, uh, exactly what you've just said liz um in terms of yeah for, i think it's such a creative and generative space i mean i think everyone is different and i think as, as liz was saying if it's not if it's not for you that's also completely fine so every every person is different and i know that some some mothers have found that you know being a mother involved so much involved so much that they just you know couldn't write and that that's also fine so I think it comes back to what Liz was saying about taking that pressure off um but also um so for me I was I was really I really just wanted to write but then it's it's those logistics it's things like childcare and um and also not putting so much pressure on yourself that it's going to be fully formed and perfect or I guess it, it involves also accepting that if you get two words down, you know, that's fine. And um, I think, yeah, for me, it, it sort of changed my relationship to writing because I had, I had been a prose writer um, up until 10 years ago. I was like a prose writer and I could only sit down and write, you know, I tried to write hundreds of words at a time. And then um, after being a mother, this is when poetry actually was, worked really well for me and I was doing an MA at the time and um, my, my tutor at the time, um, Martina Evans, just I, I became really obsessed with poetry but it worked really well, it was really fortunate because I was okay with you know just putting down a few words so I think if we can also ch you know sometimes change how we approach being creative it, it's not necessarily quantity um, but um, but yeah, as Anita is saying in the chat, there's a lot needs, a lot more needs to be done for the support. Um, yeah, the, the child care, mm. the, the financial situation um, of, of mothers, uh, because if, if you're going to be creative, you, you need the time and time, time is money. So. Mm. Lucy, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, um, I yeah kind of what's been said I think but also and especially the you know support the structural support which see one of the worst things about being a mother can you know at, at present I think is the lack of acknowledgement on stru of structural pressures and I think Jacqueline Rose wrote about that so well in her essay on mothers um but, and I also do think that there's a weird, and I don't think this was meant in the question at all, but there is for some reason a, a kind of association now of creativity, which with what I can only describe as self optimization for professional reasons that I see as exploitative and extractive rather than being creative in the sense that it's meant so I think it's a and I, and I think that kind of ties in with what Liz is saying about you know maybe people just giving themselves a bit of a break um this need to constantly produce things I, I I'm super interested in the idea of like a maternal aesthetics and whether there is one at all and I've been trying to work out whether I think mothers have maternal aesthetic there's a maternal aesthetic in poetry or or not and I'm not really sure but I do think that maybe some of the difficulties that come within writing within that constrained space like interruption like different senses of time um like this very close looking and and maybe some of the problems and difficulties can actually end up being really generative and so I suppose I'm I'm super interested in the difficulties when you're trying to write as a mother. Maybe they're the kind of the thing to focus on, not rather than fight when you're doing that work. But I don't know. That's so interesting, Lucy, because I was thinking about this other poems in the Republic of Motherhood, and they kind of weren't born out of like oh, I'm having such a relaxing, creative, <laughs> generative time. They were born out of this kind of fire and fury and wounding and frustration. 
And it's been really interesting to see those poems go out in the world and kind of meet other mothers, because there's something about that difficulty and the challenge and the frustration and the feeling like you've been knocked sideways in your own life. That, that was what actually felt quite generative for me, as opposed to kind of the, the sort of nurturing of made a human kind of creativity we think of when we've got um, little ones. Yeah, that's actually really true in terms of, yeah, if you're thinking of, yeah, the creativity was this this huge splurge to write about all of the, the struggles and the, the challenges that one was being faced with and, and just the enormous changes, you know, because as a writer, you're, you're used to, you know, expressing yourself on the page and having your reality sort of then mirrored on the page for you or exploring your reality on the page and that that's how I approach my writing and so when you're having all of these enormous changes happening in your life that that's where that it that urge to write what was was there it wasn't it wasn't oh I'm going to start at writing a historical novel or or something it was it was very related to um trying to navigate mm. this really challenging and um tumultuous time Thanks. We think of something that came up. Sorry, Lucy. Something that came up before in the questions, yes. which was do you, the impact of your writing upon your children, and and this idea that one day, and in, 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 it's kind of brought up in the the readings, wasn't it? That one day your children might, if they're curious, grow up and read these poems. And mm. I wondered if if that kind of if that sort of world around in your sort of in your thoughts somewhere. Um, I'm always paranoid about that, but then I never talk to my son about my poems and I just hope he never reads them. <laughs> but um, I have tried, I've definitely gone back and now he hardly he hardly features. I wouldn't put his name in, for example. Um, but yeah, it has been, I think at a time, and this relates to the internet, where we do like post pictures of our children on social media, you know, is that the right thing to do? I mean, I've done it, but, you know, re more recently, I'm like, I don't know. You know, there's so m there's a lot of questions about, you know, what, what are the right things to do in, in, in terms of a kind of economy of sharing, whether that's writing or just like posting a picture of your kid on social media, but it's a very complex and difficult thing navigate I think. Mm. I think one thing that I've been thinking um, recently and maybe because I'm a bit further away um, from those those raw poems from the early early years that um, that I wouldn't have wanted my my, my children to read sort of in hindsight um, but um, but then also that it's also then I've just I've been with a bit more distance. I've been thinking that actually that's a really important part of change, mm -hmm. and that the fact that actually when your children are old enough, obviously not when they are themselves, you know, you know children, but as they get older, that would be a really important conversation to have in terms of not necessarily you know less personally. I mean also personally, but just societally that that you know th this is you know, the, the structure of, of motherhood is actually really <laughs> difficult. It's very unsupported in, in society. Hence, this was my experience. And this, this is art as well. I mean, it, it could, it could lead to such so many fruitful conversations, I think, you know, that, well, this is art, it's not, you know, it's not life. But also, to talk about how they were created, Actually, I think as my children are, are growing up, I can see how those those conversations would be possible. Um, yeah, difficult, but possible and maybe necessary. Mm. That's so true. And also, I think also um, relating to maybe feminism as well and how like very, you know, having models or having, um, you know, like throwing up questions that the, not necessarily the children, like that the general reader, wanted to think about like you know like the sort of uh, feminist spirit in in certain writers um, trying to um, understand that more and I think also there's um, in the chat there's Karen Karen's uh, comment about how 
at the individual and societal lack of real understanding about the transformative impact of motherhood, and which I think some of you addresses just ad addressed to that. Um, and then how also it might follow on after the current interest in the impact of menopause. Mm. Different I stages. Recently, I recently found out this is called matrescence. I, did you know that? I didn't know that. But I just was like, oh, it's actually got a name. <laughs> matrescence, maybe, not matrescence. Mm. But it was, I find it quite relieving to hear that name. I wonder also, like, I know that in the audience there are some other women um, or mother poets or, or some people who might feel quite strongly about the topic. If there's anyone who wanted to, we probably can't go through all the comments, but, you know, if there are one or two in the audience who really wanted to say something maybe about the problems or the questions. Anita or... Sarah, or in case you have. Uh, I was just going to uh, respond um, to mm. Anita's um, point in the chat here, um, saying that personally, um, she, she says, personally, also, I'm very grateful to have become a mother, despite mm. any challenges. So many, pe so many people who wanted mm. children couldn't have them. There are many aspects of motherhood. Um, ab absolutely, Anita. And actually, um, we, part of what we're going to do is um, suggest some books um, yeah. Jenny has asked us to su suggest some books and I was going to suggest your, your book, Anita. Um, so Anita, Anita's book, Hiding to Nothing, has just come out recently. I think my copy is up. Maybe we can come back to Sarah's point, or um, if um, Lucy or Liz, you have any to share, I guess maybe she would probably pop back. <laughs> Sarah? Do you want oh. us to talk? Oh. Okay, yeah, Liz, yeah, oh. please. Do you want us to talk about our book yeah. recommendations, yes, Jenny? Please. Okay, yeah. hang on. Yeah. I'm just going to dive yeah. down and like grab them <laughs> seamlessly. <laughs> Okay, so I bought three sort of book recommendations. One's kind of about mumming and daughtering and one's a novel and one's a creative one. So the first one I, I bought is Maternal Journal and um, mm. kind of edited by Laura Godfrey Isaacs and Samantha McGowan. This comes from a really brilliant kind of nationwide project um, called Maternal Journal, which was working with mothers that are writers and artists in community centres, galleries, libraries, breastfeeding groups, bringing all kinds of artists and writers into mothers um, to sort of help them to work creatively and, and make bonds. And it's a beautiful workbook full of activities and the kind of thing you could do when you had a little one or mm -hmm. actually a kind of at any point in the journey. I also bought a book I love and I always recommend and say to people who've had their child, you must read this and it's mm. department of speculation um mm. by jenny i feel it's one of the best books i've read about those weird lovesick days of having a tiny baby i found it in the library when my son was really young and i remember thinking like someone had seen into my soul that i'd never read a book that felt like it touched that sort of that mm. crazed wild feeling and the third one is poem book about daughtering, oh. this beautiful Warson Shear book, Bless the Daughter Raised by a Voice in Her Head. It's, it's the new collection, kind of the much longed for collection. It's a really kind of raw book about being a daughter. And we talked before, didn't we, about becoming a mom when you've had a really difficult relationship with your own mom. And actually the poems in this book delve into that in a, in a sort of really deep, explorative, kind of raw way she's now a mom um, and and is looking back at her own mom and that experience of kind of not being mothered safely or well um, so those are my three mom themed picks for tonight they're all brilliant books brilliant books thank you so much thanks really must go and get them 
Um, Lucy? Um, I wanted to say Sharon Olds Odes because she's got a poem to stretch marks in, which I always remember. And she says they're like silk on Monsieur Jacquard's loom. And I loved that because I've got really, really bad stretch marks from being pregnant that are never going to go. Um, and I don't know, it's just one of those things celebrating the stretch marks. Um, but like all the all the best books you have, I've lent it to somebody. So I'm not going to show that. Um, I've been reading this this week and it's just so good. Tisha Jin's um, Keeping the House. And it's, you know, a generation's grandmother, mother, and a protagonist. Um, and like complicated relations, really, um, really sharp, astute, sort of um, thoughtful portraits. Um, really recommend keeping the house. Mm. And what did I? Oh yeah, I've got my recommend uh, exhaustion: a history, mm. which is about. It's quite a good cultural study of the history of exhaustion. I mean, when you're looking after a baby, you are obviously just exhausted, and no theory is going to help you. But I quite enjoyed reading it at one point, and I think reading about all the different ideas we've had of what it means to be tired um, and what, what, we, what we mean when we say, oh, I've got lots of energy and where all these things come from, I find super fascinating. Um, um, and maybe this is a bit pretentious, but it's meant uh, Lacan and anxiety. You know, I'm, I think I'm, I'm super, super interested in maternal anxiety. Um, and for me, anxiety is a huge part of being a mother. Probably, I think it was before I became a mother, but happens to accompany it. And I really love in Lacan, like all his diagrams of objects and subjects. And they've got that really abstract pictorial quality that I, I, I keep getting drawn to. So mm. those are my recommendations. They're brilliant. Thank you so much, Lucy. Oh, I really love your thoughts. <laughs> um, and so I think Sarah Lowe is back now. Um, I am, you... hopefully, fingers crossed. Hey. Sorry, sorry if my internet just crashed. <laughs> um, I think I was in the middle of saying that I, I strongly recommend um, Anita Patti's book, Hiding mm. to Nothing, for the way in which it explores so many aspects of motherhood or also not, not being a mother, um, miscarriage, um, the, the whole, the whole breadth of, of the subject. Um, she does it really, really um, powerfully. Um, and then some of my other favorite reads about motherhood. Um, there is um, Sharon Old's um, Satan Says, so that's her first collection, but um, yeah, there are some, a few, there are yeah, a handful of poems in there about motherhood that are really, really um, strong. Um, Fiona Benson writes obviously incredibly well about motherhood um, and even her first collection Bright Travellers has some really really great great poems in there. Um, Barney Capel has a really experimental um, really exciting um, experimental book called Humanimal. Humanimal yeah <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, everything that she writes just has such an energy and she just comes at, at motherhood um, from a completely um, innovative way in that book. And also Lely Long Soldiers is, you know, her book, whereas only has a few poems about motherhood in there and also about miscarriage, but the connection that she has um, with her daughter in with the way she writes about her relationship with her daughter and interrogating um, sort of the cult their, their cultural inheritance and sort of passing on language, all of those really difficult questions, especially so she also writes a poem about having had a difficult relationship with her father and um, sort of going on to pass that on or, you know, being both a daughter and a mother and, and the difficulties that we've been talking about today. So um, I think those are my, yeah, those are my top um, mm. 
picks um, in motherhood. That's amazing. Thank you. Like, you know, like definitely check out all these books and um, also Anita's book. <laughs> um, well, congratulations, Anita. And, um, and also, um, I haven't um, mentioned, like, we need to remember, like, I, I put out the link also, uh, Sarah Liz, uh new upcoming collection happening very soon is it January uh, January yeah um after all we have traveled um so really looking forward to that um so um thanks so much I I hope that um you know we all um derive a lot of um you know new wisdom now uh, knowledge and um ideas and questions um as well as answers about um this topic which uh, can be quite difficult to talk about at times and um, but I think I just wanted to kind of, um, um, you know, like bravo to all these uh, wonderful poets who have, you know, like just given us such a, a, a lot of new things to think about. And um, your work are just really very life affirming and, um, you know, thought provoking. Um, and thanks to thanks Liz and Lucy and Sarala for this wonderful evening. And I hope that you can stay tuned next time um, for the next reading or we'll, um, post up more details about um, the, our readers next time. Thanks so very much for joining us today. Um, let's give a big clap to our <laughs> to our wonderful poets. Um, maybe we need to unmute ourselves. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you so much for organizing it. Thank you. Thank you. Remember to go and get all these books if they are not on your bookshelves already. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks very much. Yeah.